that to your own application for the position of chairperson of IABC. Correct. Yeah. And in light of that, all the conversation around it will be uh, geared towards that. And hopefully, by the end of the day, we get to know each other better. We'll also get to know you in a very specific way in relation to this position that you have shown interest in. Uh, before we do that, uh, Mr. Taib, it is important that you get to know the kind of people you are conversing with, isn't it? Correct. Yes, and I'll start off by saying my names are Bernadette Musundi. My name is Abdul Ghafoor El Busaidi. My name is Evans Monari. And I'm David Oginde. Ogla <coughs> Karani. I am Tom Baluto. Thank you, my lord. Dr. Mohan Lumba. Senior, my name is Mary Karen Srobit. Thank you, David. And I'm Peter Karanja. Thank you, sir. And with me, uh, with us here, we are facilitated by, uh, facilitated by a secretariat, uh, which is headed by the secretary to the Senate, uh, or the Public Service uh, Commission, the Parliamentary Service Commission. Uh, Together with me here, I have Madam Shadia uh, uh, Farid, and with her is Uni, Mrs. Eunice Kishangi at the back, and the rest of the members be with them are the members of the Secretariat, and also uh, employees or people from the Secretariat from uh, the Parliament, Parliamentary Service Commission. Thank you. So, uh, with us here, uh, this is a very, very special conversation. We have members of the media, whom I have extended a very warm welcome. They will be recording our discussions today. And together with them, we also have members of the public whom we invited. Yes. They are up in the gallery. Don't bother, they will, you will not be able to see them, yes. but they are seated up there and they are very welcome. And they should not worry us, we, they are listening into our discussions. Yes. And that is the kind of uh, group we have around, uh, around with our, with the, during these discussions. So once again, as I said, I'll, now that you know who we are, yes. I think it is also important that we also get to know you. And uh, I'll pose this question to you. One, <coughs> the kind of position we are interviewing you for or discussing with you is chairperson. I, both a, a very serious manager and a great leader. That's what it all entails, isn't it? Correct. Yeah, in light of that, we are going to manage our time very well, all of us, yes. both from our side and your side too. And therefore, we'll be asking uh, uh, some questions, and uh, through those questions, from the answers that you provide, it will help us to move uh, very fast and get to discuss much more than uh, maybe what we thought we would if we manage our time well. So the first question I would like you to uh, pose to you is this. Briefly tell us about yourself in relation to your academic qualifications and also professional and in light of the fact that this have prepared you very well for you to feel strong enough to put in an application and ask for this position of chairperson of IABC. Madam Chair, I was born in Kitui and I was brought up in uh, the Ukambani area of our great republic. I went to school there. I then moved to Nairobi, finished my education at Nairobi School and then moved on to the University of Nairobi where I studied law. After that, I went on to the Kenya School of Law where I did my postgraduate diploma in law and was thereafter admitted to the bar to practice law in December 1988. Since then, I've been practicing law and I'm now approaching 28 years in the active practice of law. Due to my involvement in the representation of clients who were at that time called political clients during the struggle for the second liberation, I was thereafter drawn into active politics because the line defining the practice of law and activism in the struggle became blurred. And that is how I ended up being mayor of Mombasa in the year 2003. I went through a very accelerated period of learning during my stint in politics 
and particularly as mayor of Mombasa, in both the aspects of administration of a city and the balancing with the, the administration with the political side of the equation. And I genuinely think that coupled with the knowledge of the law that I have uh, practiced for the last 20 year, 28 years, I am uniquely placed to be able to contribute towards the development of our country. And you may notice, Chair Lady, that I did not apply the first time that you advertised. It's because I was hesitant. It was, it's a great responsibility. It is not an office that you go in to take your time or to uh, smell the flowers or the coffee, as you may say. It is a serious office that requires serious commitment and that may take a toll on you personally. And it was only after deep reflection is that I decided to apply the second time that you put out the advertisement. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them, my lady. I believe you you affiliated to some professional body, isn't it? Yes. And you also maybe belong to some other associations. My question is that um, if you are, could you mention them? And also uh, point out how they have assisted you in your leadership so as to, I mean, something towards your leadership. Primarily, I have always been a member of the Law Society of Kenya, and I have participated in that uh, society not only as uh, a member for the coast province, but I eventually became the vice chairman of the Law Society of Kenya in the years 1993 to 95, if I remember correctly. And I served my vice uh, chairmanship under the former Chief Justice, uh, Dr. Willie Mutunga. He was the chairman and I was his vice chairman. And uh, I have uh, participated fully in the activities of the Law Society to the best of my knowledge. In addition to that, I'm a member of the Certified Institute of Public uh, Secretaries and have been so for the last nine years. I have not taken any further uh, politically active position in those organizations after my stint as the vice chairman in the years 93 to 95. And I've remained simply as a member. Uh, thank you. Uh, have you in any way been a decorated, armed forces call it decoration, but have you been awarded, given an award from any of these uh, bodies or any other internationally or nationally? No, my lady. I have not been, I have not had the honor of receiving any award okay. from any quarter. Okay. Um, Mr. Taib, now it's my turn to go to my colleagues and uh, this conversation will take some time. Uh, please bear with us. I would like to invite you to <coughs> take a sip of water when you want. You don't need to get uh, permission or any kind. Of, just Thank take some water which is before you and I'll start off with um, asking uh, Justice retired uh, Tom Baluto to start us off with discussions yes. in a particular area. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Mr. Tai. Yes, my Lord. What um, would you do if you became the chairperson of the IEBC to enhance the legitimacy and the credibility of the IEBC? My Lord. The one extremely critical component of running an organization like the IEBC is winning the public confidence and the confidence of the stakeholders. If you cannot, from the word go, win their confidence, you are wasting your time in this organization. You are a complete waste of time and resources. The the technical part of running an election is well known, it is simple, it is straightforward, it is a wheel that doesn't need to be reinvented. It is being conducted all over the world, every year, every month, and the mechanics of it is well known to the experts. But an organization like the IEBC needs to have the confidence of those it purports to hold elections for, both the candidates and the electorate and the political parties on whose behalf it assumes the position of referee. 
if you have no confidence from the stakeholders, then you have nothing at all. So my first proposed action will be to make sure that I get in touch with all leaders of all political parties from all sides of the political divide. Those parties in power, those parties not in power, the large significant parties and the small supposedly insignificant parties. The NGOs who have great expertise in the area of elections, all stakeholders, I must reach out to them. I must gain their confidence. I must know what concerns they have. I must prove to them that indeed I am addressing those concerns in a manner that is within the law and within our ability. As the chair, if you become the chair of IEBC, yes, what lessons would you draw from the elections of 2013? My Lord, I hesitate to, to publicly state uh, any position because, and I qualify this because any chair of the IEBC doesn't go to that office to exercise his discretion. Any chair of the IEBC and the commissioners in the IEBC go there to implement the law as encapsulated by the will of parliament which bears the sovereignty of the people. So whatever answer I give must be qualified with the understanding that first and foremost we must obey the law, we must follow what parliament has legislated, and we cannot operate outside those four corners of the law. But the greatest lesson I will learn, and anybody can see, is that it is dangerous to rely on only one system. You must have multiple methods of correlating and counter-checking and verifying the results. But even that is on the technical side. The biggest lesson I have I can take from the 2013 is that there must be no acrimony between the referee and the political parties. The political parties can fight, but the IEBC cannot afford to be part of those fights. We must put out a very robust communication mechanism to reach not only the political parties and its leaders, but also the general public. We must run the organization in a transparent way. You cannot afford to run an office like the IEBC while hoarding information and hoarding the mechanisms within which decision-making processes are actually conducted. Those are my humble lessons that I will take, my Lord. Thank you. Um, tell me, did you know of um, a leader of, of the Soviet Union who used to be called Joseph Stalin in yes. the 1940s? I, I didn't know of him, but I read of him, my lord. You read about him? Yes, my lord. Yes, yes. Now, I want to, to read uh, something he said. Yes. He said about elections. Those who vote decide nothing. But those who count the vote decide everything. Correct. Do you agree? And if you do, why? Stalin said that, my lord, during the second meeting of the Supreme Soviet, when uh, Trotsky was planning to oust him, and he felt very bitter about the factionalization of the Supreme Soviet, and he came to that conclusion, as Machiavelli will put it quite correctly, that he didn't, know, he didn't need to know the people who vote, but he needed to know the person who counted uh, the votes, which meant he wanted to rig the elections, basically. That was possible, my lord, in the context of the Soviet Union, as it was secretive, uh, terror, uh, application of uh, uh, executions as a means of governance. But it is a system that I cannot see can take root in a great republic like Kenya, where today everybody is accountable and everybody is expected to adhere to a certain code of ethics and where the systems must be run in a transparent manner, not only under the supervision and oversight of parliament, 
but under the supervision and oversight now under section 44 of the amended election act of the stakeholders themselves in a committee with the elections. So I will say, my Lord, Stalin was correct in that context. But though it doesn't diminish the importance of the IEBC today, it only emphasizes that the people you as a panel choose to run this organization must be people who are credible, who are reliable, and who will deliver on the trust that you place on their hands. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Justice Mbaluto. I will ask uh, my colleague, Mary Karen, to pose a few questions. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Now, Senior, as you know, currently, there is no specific legal framework for the alteration of county, county boundaries and dispute res resolution arising out of county boundaries to an extent that currently there is a bill pending before the Senate. If, as a chair of IBC, an advisory or legal opinion is sought for me regarding the mechanism. What would you give? My lady, you, you must have some pity on me or in the sense that I currently do not possess the data that is necessary to arrive at any such decisions. I believe the if, uh, if and only if I have the great honor to serve as the chairman of the IEBC. I will have to quickly go through the process of acquiring the necessary data and knowledge that will allow me to even guess as to what opinion I will give. But for the moment, I will say this, my lady. It is imperative that the, any chair of the IEBC and any commissioner to follow only the law as legislated by parliament there is no room to move outside the law if parliament in its wisdom decides to amend the law then again we will follow the amended version of the law or if the supreme court renders an advisory opinion then that also will be implemented but it will be dangerous for any commissioner coming in to take upon themselves to interpret the law and actually end up doing some sort of judicial activism in an area that ought to be very straightforward. And if it isn't, then Parliament ought to, ought to be requested to clarify. Okay, thank you. Now, one of the challenges facing voter registration is access to voter registration centers. What innovation would you put in place to enhance voter registration given the limited resources? My lady, even before going to the voter registration, it is clear also from the recommendations of the select bipartisan committee, parliamentary committee, that there are certain steps that need to be taken before we go to the voter registration exercise or the mass voter registration exercise. The entire election and its credibility rests on the voters register, starting right from the uh, 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 police polling station register, going to the ward register, the constituency register, the county register, and then the national register. It is imperative that this register is accurate and is credible and it's open to verification. Only then we will we think about going into extra or the mass voter registration to build up on a credible voter register. But with the resources that I think the IEBC has and the manpower that is already there. It should be an issue of communicating the intentions of the IEBC. And uh, 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 a value should be placed on letting the public know the importance of the registration exercise itself. And I hope that there are mechanisms in place to ensure the turnouts. But we've seen a failure of that in the past. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'll now turn to Bishop David Oginde, to ask one question, Thank please. You. Thank you, Wana Mayor. Um, you are familiar with the systems, uh, technological systems that were used during the last elections. There were actually three uh, that were used. The law now provides that we should have an integrated system 
and actually that that's what should be used. Give us your take. If you became chair, how would you ensure that this actually happens and that the system works and provides credible results? Thank you, Bishop. My work has been made easy by, again, the select bipartisan uh, parliamentary committee which investigated the matter and came up with its proposals, which now have been encapsulated in Section 44 of and Section 8A of the Elections Amended uh, uh, Act. If you look at Section 8A and if you look at Section 44, it actually lays out for whoever comes into that office the roadmap towards a successful implementation of an election program. So it is my intention, uh, Bishop, to ensure that I give effect to the will of Parliament by implementing those steps. For example, it talks about cleaning of the voter register. Obviously, the parliamentary... Com uh, I'm addressing myself specifically to the issue of use of technology. Yes. How do we utilize or uh, implement technology to give us transparent, credible results? As you know, in the last elections, there were some disputes and there were some failures. You as chair, what would you do? Knowing that I am not an IT expert myself, but as I say, you don't have to be a cook to criticize the broth. Certainly you know what is being served to you and you know whether it's good or not. But technology is unavoidable. Its use, its correct use, can lead to a very, very credible election. And similarly, its misuse can lead to a very, very warped uh, result. Again, Section 44 talks about the implementation of the electronic system. The formation of the committee in which the stakeholders must also be present, including the political parties, in the implementation process and the supervision. It is actually a good scent because for the first time we have a negotiated settlement that says it's not only the IEBC who should be calling the shots on the implementation and oversight of the electronic system. The parties themselves will be represented, the NGOs will be represented, all stakeholders will be represented, and therefore it's a shared responsibility. It is not even the responsibility of the IEBC or the chair itself. It is a process that will be at all stages supervised and oversighted, and hopefully we come to a result that is credible and a system that is reliable and dependable. But a word of caution. It failed last time. It failed. Parliament must address this issue. What happens? Not the IEBC, because the IEBC does not have legislative power. Parliament must address itself genuinely to this question. What happens? The law as it is, as it is, as it is read now, or as I humbly read it now, is that you have no option but to register using the electronic system, to identify the voter using the electronic system, and to relay the results using the electronic system. So Parliament must advise the IEBC what happens if the system fails to identify a voter? What happens if the system fails to register a voter? What happens if the system fails to relay the results? And the world is full of examples where IT has worked wonderfully, and the world similarly is full of examples where IT has failed miserably. Thank you, Bernard Taib. Uh, those are good questions, but you know Parliament will not be with you. Yes. You are the chair of the commission, and the law is as is, unless, of course, it's changed before then. What would you do in the uh, event that actually the, this failure, as chair, the, world, the nation is looking up to you, how do you still deliver a credible election with a system that has failed either wholly or partly. That's what we would want to hear. 
Thank you, Bishop. And I believe that will be the hardest question I should, I should face. But be, because you are asking the chair of IEBC or even the commission of the IEBC to even contemplate doing something that it is not authorized to do by parliament. To me, that is impossible. You cannot break the law even if you have good intentions. We will execute our mandate as authorized by law. Nothing more, nothing less. Panatayib. Yes. I think you, uh, it's a, you are a lawyer, so I'm not a lawyer. But you are hiding a lot behind the law. We would like to hear, when you are there and the Kenyans are pressurizing you for results. Yes. You can't turn them to parliament. By that time, there will be no parliament. Yes. We want to hear, how do you deal with that crisis situation as a leader? I apologize if I gave the impression that I was hiding behind the law. I wasn't. I was actually trying to emphasize that I will live within the law. And we will, we will with the resources available, make sure that the electronic register and the electronic system does what it is required by parliament to do. But in the unfortunate eventuality that it fails, then we must fall back to our paper trail, which we will make sure is also up to date to ensure that we are able, where there are gaps, to fit it. Because as you know, rightly point out, you cannot tell Kenyans that you cannot deliver the results. That is, that is not even thinkable. It is not thinkable. So, but, my uh, uh, bishop, but whatever we do, we will do with the participation of all stakeholders. We will lay out the roadmap with them. We will walk this path with them. We must depart from the path where we sat and made decisions separately, alone, and then hope that everybody will swallow the results. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm sure somebody else will follow up on that question. Uh, it's an interesting question, uh, Mr. Taib. Eh? Most obliged. I think you yeah, I will now turn to your learned friend, Evans Munare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Council, one of the things that you will face if you were to chair the IEBC will be the issue of disputes, either before nominations, after nominations, uh, and even after the elections. Uh, how prepared are you to deal with these issues? And first and foremost, how do you understand the, this dispute resolution area with regard to party nominations, with regard to uh, your role and also that the role of the political parties, uh, disputes, the tribunal? How do you understand the role of the IEBC to be and how prepared are you to ensure that by the end of this exercise, uh, Kenyans are, are, are extremely uh, satisfied with the decisions that you make as a commission, uh, as the head of that commission? Yeah. Thank you, Council. My presumption is that the IEBC as currently constituted has within itself the capacity both in terms of resources and in terms of manpower and is prepared or has prepared itself to be able to deal with all the eventualities that council has rightly pointed out require to be addressed this is my presumption but one of the things that i will propose requires to be done immediately any person uh, 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 is appointed as chair and immediately the commission is appointed is that there must be an audit of the IEBC, an audit that is conducted by professional firms, both within government or outside government if necessary. Professional people to do a thorough, not only structural audit, but also an ethical audit. We have these organs within the IEBC. Do they have the personnel? Do they have the competent personnel to man them, to discharge the obligation that the laws places upon them? If they do, do they have the resources and the means within which to discharge their obligations or their duties? If that also passes, then do we have the timelines set out within which to do those functions? Council, it is indeed something that will have to be urgently addressed. 
those organs, they are there in the law, they have to be equipped with the personnel, the competent personnel and the resources that is required and equipped very quickly, set up and running to be able to discharge their obligations. I do not deny it is going to be a major challenge. Looking at the very, very strict time frame that we have at our disposal before the general election. But again, Council, it has to be done. It has to be done, God willing. It has to be done. Thank you. Now, in the build-up to the next general elections, Kenyans will be fed with a lot of uh, opinion polls. Uh, and then there are also calls for uh, a parallel sort of uh, uh, tallying of votes. What would you say about that and how would you ensure that what the Kenyans finally consume are the results that they should be consuming and that they are not distracted by either opinion polls or by parallel transmission of the, ta of, 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 of the tallying process? Council, again, that is another challenge that anybody who goes to the IEBC will have to confront. Do you have the authority to stop somebody from having their own system or not? It is a, it is a debatable question. What is not debatable is that it is only the IEBC that is mandated by the law to communicate, to collate and communicate the results and to announce or declare the results of the election. And as far as I can see, that is how it should be and there will be no other available avenue that will be entertained for this, for, for this purpose. The law recognizes the IEBC and therefore the only binding results are those that are declared by the IEBC. We are in a democracy. You cannot prevent the conduct of opinion polls unless it is outside, it is conducted outside the ambit of the relevant statute that governs opinion polls. If they are within the law, you cannot interfere with that. Again, you must address not where the dust settles, you must not condemn why these people are setting up parallel systems. You must look at the reason as to why they are setting up parallel systems. They are setting up parallel systems because they have no confidence in the primary lawful system. So it will be up to us to talk to them, to open lines of communication, to build confidence with them, to win their trust. We know it will not be easy, but we have to win their trust that our system is up to scratch. It will do the job. Thank you, Mr. Taib. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, finally, um, there will be the issue of offences, uh, election offences committed by candidates and even voters between now and the elections. We have not seen much punishment by the previous uh, uh, electoral commissions so that we ensure that there's discipline as a people as we go into the elections. Will you take action against individuals who commit election offenses and bar them from running for seats or even voting? Thank you, Council. If we do not implement the law fairly, without preconceived notions or discrimination, without fear or favor, and especially without favor to one side against another side, we will not have a credible election. So my answer is that we not only should, we shall, God willing, implement the law to its letter. We will build up capacity. We must build up the capacity to be able to do so on the condition, on the condition that we do it not to prejudice any party but do it fairly across the board to everyone. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. Thank you, uh, Mr. Manari. And thank you, Mr. Tayub. Please take some water. Thank you very much. <laughs> we still have to move on yes, forward. Okay. Yeah. Mm, I will now turn to my colleague, uh, Okla Karani, who may ask one or two questions in a very interesting area. Please, Okla. Thank you, Bwana Mayor. 
Now, the, the two-third gender balancing is a principle that is embedded in our constitution, which we have not yet achieved sufficiently. In your view, what steps needs to be taken to ensure that this principle is actualized? The Supreme Court came up with an advisory opinion on the issue of the implementation of the gender rule. And they talked very much uh, or very, very deeply about the right actualizes immediately but is implemented progressively. And they even gave a guideline and a date by which they thought it ought to have been implemented while acknowledging it was impossible to implement by the 2013 general election they gave a date of about 2015 in which they hoped all the parties that were required to coordinate and implement ought to have done so but we're already in 2016 and we have seen that this rule has not been actualized it's not even a rule it is a fundamental right that is stated in the constitution we are ready or rather uh, let me not presume if you grant me the honor to become the chair of the IABC I will ensure that we engage all the necessary organs of government that we rope in the opposition and work with all like-minded parties to ensure that whatever steps that require to be taken to actualize the gender principle should be taken as quickly as possible. But it is with the same breath, and I wish to clarify because I'm sure this is a concern to you. It is not an obligation that can be carried out by the IEBC alone. It is not within its power to ensure that it is carried out within the meaning given to it by the Constitution. But we are an important cog in the wheel of actualizing that. But we must work with other sectors of government. And I don't see any further excuse for the delay of the implementation of the gender rule. I personally do not see any excuse that is valid. But not a single agency is able to do it alone. So what proposals are you giving that will see the implementation actualized, especially on an elective process? If it is possible. If it is within the law, we must ensure that the nominations that are submitted by political parties respect that principle. If that is not possible, we must ask Parliament to pass the necessary legislation for actualization of the gender principle, which has been done to a certain extent. But I am being honest with you when I say that I do not have a very concrete answer for you in this regard because it is not something that is up to the IEBC alone. Even if you have the best will, and even if I give you my undertaking today, it will still be subject to the various organs of government coming together to actualize this. But it is something that is unavoidable. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I would have loved to hear uh, your proposal, especially um, as as a leader in helping more women to be elected to reduce the nomination. However, let's go to something else that is related to gender rule. And this is about the nominations of the marginalized groups and the people with disabilities. There are two different schools of thought currently. Some would wish that this list is provided before the elections. Another school of thought considers that this list should be provided after the elections. What are your views? And how do you think that your, your view would affect the stability of the country after the elections? Thank you, my lady. I know it is, a, it is a requirement that I give you my views. But again, I'm hesitant in making open statements in regard to something that is not entirely within my power. To, uh, to, to implement, or something that prejudices the IEBC, or has the potential to prejudice the IEPC, or the position of the Commission. I say this because we cannot discuss the IEBC as if 
it is an omnipotent body that makes its own decisions. It is a body that must make its decision within the four corners of the law. So there is a limited amount of discretion that the law allows you, and there are certain areas that are a no-go zone, which are the areas of legislation, without which much cannot be achieved. But let me say this. Subject to our agreement that the law will determine the final outcome. My personal view, my personal view is that all lists should be submitted before the election. And the simple reason is to avoid these lists being used as tools to win political favor, support, or manipulating of manipulation of the electorate. That is my personal view as to whether I can, if given the honor to lead the IEBC, as to whether I can legally enforce that position, I will leave it open for the moment. And the only reason I was, I was uh, frustr appearing to frustrate you in the previous question is because of my insistence that the IEBC is a referee. The IEBC does not make the law. It is a referee within the law. Thank you. And the IEBC chairman is the leader. Yes, my lady. I'm done, madam. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Taim. Uh, now, on that point, we turn straight to another interesting question, and I'll ask Canon Karanja to put a question, one or two questions to you, please. Canon Karanja. Thank you very much, Chair. Mr. Taib, it's very nice to talk to you. Thank you, Canon Karanja. The electoral laws of Kenya do not allow the use of state resources by any party to gain ad advantage over their competitors, either candidates or political parties. Yes. What have been your obs observation on how state resources have been used uh, in electoral campaigns uh, within the campaign period that is defined in the law and outside? And as chair of IBC, how would you enforce the provisions to ensure that state resources are used for state processes as defined by the law and not for political advantage? Thank you. Thank you, Kanon Karanja. In the past, the state has always gotten away with the use of state resources by hiding behind the obscurity of their own personal selves and the division with their, cell, their other selves as occupants of offices of government. For example, the simplest method is to use government vehicles in the conduct of campaigns and argue at the same time that you are occupying that position and therefore are entitled to the use of the resources that accompany the office that you occupy. This must stop. I think the, if you go back to the 90s and then back to uh, the, 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 the final years when uh, multipartism actually started taking root in Kenya, you will find that despite the law being put in place to prevent certain things, we have only won the ability to implement the law incrementally, whether we like it or not. We have placed laws, or rather we've put laws into place, but the ability to actualize those laws and implement has been an incremental exercise. But I believe we have come to the position, Canon, that we must now implement the law as it is. And what the law says about use of state resources and its denial of state resources to be used in campaign of uh, either individuals or parties must be implemented. Our biggest shortcoming as Kenyans has not been the absence of laws, has been the failure to implement laws. And we will do our part to implement those laws. Again, Canon Karanja, I am, I am humbly saying that I'm not avoiding the, the question in its depth. I am simply saying that we will give the leadership to implement the laws that are currently in place. Chair, I would like to follow up a little on that uh, discussion. The clock is ticking quickly to the next elections. And Kenyans are looking at the chair of IABC actually being able to implement and enforce the law. I think Kenyans are entitled to hear some concrete insights on how as chair of IABC you'll go about ensuring the law as regards the use of state resources, by vested interests 
is enforced. It cannot be a general blanket thing. We need to hear some concretes. Again, the law cannot uh, provide for an organ within the IEBC for the monitoring of campaigns, for the documentation of breach of the law in relation to campaigns, and for the prosecution of those concerned. It provides an organ also for the monitoring of on, on hate speech. There is also another government agency that is responsible for that. But I give you my word, God willing, we will implement. We, I, as I said before, as soon as, we, as soon as one goes into office, you must conduct an audit and you must build up the capacities very quickly of these organs. And we, we have no other alternative but to implement the laws that are already in existence. Thank you. Shift to another line. Um, Mr. Taib, this is a stress-laden job that you have sought for as chair of IBC. Do you have any incidences in your life where you can tell us about situations where you act under extreme stress for prolonged periods and what were your coping mechanisms? During the violence that rocked our country in 2007, I was separated from my family as violence consumed the country. To me, that was a time of the utmost stress. Because at the same time, my child, at that time two years old, was sick in hospital, very critical. The state of the nation was such that nobody could move with any degree of safety. Law and order had broken down. I felt helpless. I felt under stress. And I had no means at my disposal within which, first of all, to even attempt to help my family, leave alone to contribute toward helping the nation itself. But my coping mechanism has always been first to turn to my God. First and foremost, to pray, which I do every day, five times a day. I believe that nothing is possible without God, and I believe that nothing is impossible with God. I also believe that nothing happens without God willing it. And God always wishes us well, but whatever vice befalls us is of our own doing. That is always my first bastion, prayer. Then action. Then you have to act. And you have to act in a decisive manner that will enable you to overcome your problem. And my mechanism for coping with a problem is to confront it. I keep reminding myself. It's not that it's by nature, but I keep reminding myself that do not run away from the problem. Do not hide. Do not expect time to erase the problem. Confront it for good or for worse. That is your destiny. It Thank you, Chair. I think I'm answered. <clears throat> thank you, Kanan Karanja. And also thank you, Taim. Yeah, please bear with us. We still have more questions to ask. And I'll turn now to my uh, Professor Elb Said to ask you uh, two questions, please. <clears throat> Mr. Taib, Marha. welcome. Shukran. Bro. Now, how can commissioners of IEBC, being full-time commissioners with a lot of uh, powers but, uh, under Article uh, 88 and 80, yes. avoid interfering or meddling with the activities of the Secretariat? Again, Professor Shukran, for that question, as my lady had pointed out, you have 
as the chair to provide leadership. And the first thing that I was proposing to do is that we must agree on an integrity and administrative pact between commissioners, primary of which is non-interference with the workings of the Secretariat. If we cannot realize the complementary but exclusive nature of these two bodies, the Commission and the Secretariat, then we cannot comprehend anything else. And the Commissioners cannot do the work of the Secretariat, just as the Secretariat may not and shall not conduct the work of the Commission. It is the job of the Commission to decide on policy, to make decisions, and it is the job of the Secretariat to implement. I believe, I strongly believe, that the quality of the Commissioners you will select or propose for selection will be of the caliber that understands this very primary principle. But in addition to that, it must be constantly reinforced coming from the chairman downwards. It must be constantly reinforced and constantly put into practice. And we must separate these two functions. We have no choice, Professor. Under the conditions we are in now, the commission has not been there for quite some time. Yes. And now we have the secretariat. Now, how will you, in your, if when you come, if you come, separate and uh, change any uh, what uh, elect actions that have been taken by the secretariat, which, uh, in your opinion, are not the right decision? All the commissioners must be brought up to speed on what decisions have been taken at the level of the commission. We must then compare those decisions to what is actually being implemented by the Secretariat. And the intention is to see whether there are any gaps in terms of what the Secretariat is doing and whether those actions are underpinned by decisions, policy decisions made by the Commission. That is the first job that must be conducted. Because it is possible, it is quite possible that the Secretariat may be undertaking actions that do not have the validation of the Commission. Once that has been identified, we must rectify it, reverse it if necessary. We must also look at all the contracts that have been meted out or given out and to see whether they have complied with the law. If they have, we have no reason to interfere. If they haven't, we must immediately bring them to a halt. And in this regard, we must also provide the leadership to bring in our stakeholders. Remember, Professor, we talked about winning the trust, about winning the confidence of the stakeholders. You cannot win that confidence if you not bring them in, even to such a sensitive issue as procurement. Because once people view you as corrupt in procurement, <clears throat> it is unlikely that they will concur that you are not corrupt in other spheres of or the manner in which conduct your affairs. Then it is also critical at the, th at the third uh, uh, level to give each commissioner a supervisory role on the different directorates and activities of the secretariat. Yes, the secretariat is supposed to implement independently, but there must be oversight. It is a, s a simple position of delegate but supervise. You cannot delegate and then not supervise. And each commissioner will be given a thematic area or a cluster of areas in which they are expected to keep a close oversight, not active participation, close oversight, and report regularly to the commission. I expect that under normal circumstances, the commission should be meeting at intervals. But bearing in mind that we have only eight months left to the elections, these meetings will become more frequent and eventually may even stop becoming weekly and have to become daily as we approach the election. Because we have no option. God willing, we must deliver the mandate within the period provided. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for those questions. Uh, Mr. Taib, I'm going to ask you to take some water too. <laughs> thank you, my lady. <laughs> um, you have spoken very well about the importance of enforcing of the law, which you believe in, and we also believe in that too. Now we are turning to a very important area of our constitution, 
and that is chapter six of the constitution which i'm very sure you are very much aware of it isn't correct. it correct yeah it is uh, about leadership and integrity to us the chair of iabc must demonstrate this and therefore i'm going to request colleagues of mine to lead you in a discussion in the, in, within those topics that I've discussed yes. with you. So I ask Bishop Oginde uh, with the others to lead this discussion on leadership and integrity under Chapter 6 of the Constitution. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Banataib, if you could just uh, tell us briefly, you know, part of the reason we are here today is because of perceptions of impropriety within the Commission. And uh, Kenyans are looking to having a commission that is deals above board, and you've said that yourself. Please tell us how you will ensure that, not only from your personal self, your commission, but also the secretariat and the hundreds of workers that you are going to have. You are going to be the leader in that whole team if you can briefly tell us how you will ensure that integrity is upheld within the Commission. Thank you, Bishop. To do that question justice, I must again warn myself against pretending to oversimplify the problem. The problem is not simple, but with the same breath I must say that the problem is not insurmountable. The first thing that must be done is the audit that I have talk talked about. And there must be an integrity pact among the, commissioner, the commissioners themselves. We must lead by example. You cannot challenge corruption if you yourself are going to partake in corruption. You lose not only the moral authority, you have the fear of exposure. So the first and foremost thing is that we must have an integrity pact between the commissioners. We must lead by example. And then we must conduct an ethical audit of the IEBC. Not, as, not by ourselves, but again involving the stakeholders. We must not only conduct this ethical audit of the IEBC, we must deal with all the issues that arise and come out of that ethical audit. We must rectify them without any fear, without mercy, if I may say so. I've said before that the problem in our great republic is not the absence of laws. It has always been the absence of implementation of those laws. So little as you may see it, my determination is to implement the law. And I believe very strongly that when you implement the law, you resolve issues. When you refuse to implement the law, then you preside over the rot that continues to grow like a cancer. I will ensure the enforcement of the code of conduct. We already have that code of conduct. It is laid out not only in Chapter 6, it is there also in the, under the IEBC Act it must be implemented. It cannot be implemented by the chair because the chair cannot be everywhere at the same time. It can only be implemented effectively if you recognize that you have to have an institution that deals with it on a daily basis. And it is my determination to not only set up that institution, but to ensure that it is manned by capable people who are able to discharge that duty effectively. We must plug the holes in procurement. I don't think you can convince any Kenyan today on the street that procurement at the IABC is not subject to so many improprieties. I don't know whether that is true or not true, but I know that you cannot convince any Kenyan that it is not true. And the, the, the thing is that you must demystify procurement. You must not only do it above board, you must even alert the people who participate in the procurement process that they should exercise their rights of appeal internally and appeal externally to the procurement uh, authority, independent procurement authority and the tribunal. Those are the preliminary tripwire safeguards. We must all also encourage our stakeholders to blow the whistle whenever they notice something is amiss. 
But most importantly, it is my intention, God willing, to ensure that under the chairman's direct purview is the oversight function of procurement. We do not participate in procurement. I agree that. That is the secretary's job. But the oversight has to be effective. And you have to recognize also that there are experts in this field which we need to bring into the IEBC to ensure that as much as possible we clean this area that has tarnished the image of the IEBC. Um, just, just to uh, add to that, you, you do know that compromise is not just in procurement. Yes. There will be people who want results to go in a particular way and they will uh, bring you bags of money or to bring to your colleagues. How do you, as chair, deal with that? Could you give us an example of where you have stood for integrity uh, as a person and with colleagues or people you're working with? Because what do you do if you, as chair, are standing for integrity, but you learn that some of your colleagues may not be as committed and therefore are going out of the way? What do you do as chair if there's another chicken gate in your house? It is something not to be taken lightly because what you are putting forward is a scenario that is not only expected but is likely to be in the foremost of the minds of Kenyans. Just by accepting to apply for this job, I am stepping down financially. I will be earning drastically and severely less than I will be earning under the IEBC. Why am I agreeing to taking a drastic step down? Because by God's grace, I have my businesses and by God's grace, I have my practice. And I am, I thank God, I am doing quite well. And when I looked at what the pay was for the IEBC, I could immediately see that I was going to have to tighten my belt severely. Because I'm not allowed to do any other work if I am honored with this position. But remember I mentioned 2007 to Canon Karanja. I do not know of any other job in this republic of ours. The positive outcome of which is the direct, the direct safety of my family than the chair of the IEBC. Not even the president's job has such a direct effect on the security of my family as does the job of the chair of the IEBC. Because the IEBC has the potential for both a safe, peaceful, and secure election and the continuance or the change of persons in power and with the twin side of the edge of the blade, it is capable of horrendous violence that can rip our country apart. So on a selfish basis, I decided to apply for this job because I want to protect myself and my family and my people and this great republic. It is not the financial package that has attracted me to this job. And if it were, then I am losing. I am on the losing end. Secondly, Bishop, what price do you place on your own integrity? You're a bishop. I am sure you have faced difficult decisions in your life many times before. And your faith and your need to be a person of integrity has prevailed. I want, because this is a one-term job, I cannot run for another term. I want, God willing, that when I am done with this job, I can meet you in the street and you will fit me out. You will praise me. You will embrace me. You will speak highly of me. I do not wish to live in a country where after my tenure in office, all you can say when you see me is thief. 
in this age of the FM radio and the mobile phone, almost anybody on the street can call in and tell everybody what a thief you are and abuse you all sorts of manner of... So I don't know about how much money will be offered, but I know that my integrity is valuable to me and God willing, I pray for the strength not to partake in any of those activities. Thank you, Bishop Oginde, and thank you, uh, Mr. Taib. May I request uh, Canon Kanaranja to ask one question in the same topic that we are talking about? Canon Kanaranja, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Mr. Taib, you've asked for a job that is uh, virtually a poison chalice. Yes, sir. Virtually, almost anything you do is likely to please some people very much and offend others very much. In the very highly polarized country that we are in, and Kenyans are looking for a leadership that can be creative. I would like to ask you, is there any evidence in your life that you've been able to adopt a strategy on a matter that may be unpopular conventionally and had the, the strength to push it through and be vindicated later that you were wise in that choice without really hoping to please people but to accomplish an objective? It's a difficult question, Canon, because one normally doesn't go into life gauging their, their, their uh, uh, levels of adversity that they, that they are presented with. But I remember one of the most difficult decisions I had to made, make was when I was mayor of Mombasa and there was a referendum for the constitution. The first draft was prepared by my side of the party in power. And I disagreed completely with the contents of that constitution. And I had a stark choice. Stick with my party and keep my job as mayor of Mombasa. Or stick with my principles and support the no vote to the constitution and lose my job as mayor of Mombasa. It was not an easy decision, yes, but it was clear as night and day to me. Because it was not an issue of who I was to please, it was an issue of whether my conscience accepted the draft constitution as it was. My conscience did not. I therefore decamped, went to ODM, and voted and campaigned for the no vote, and eventually lost my job as mayor of Mombasa. I was not sad at all. I did what I thought was right. Remember, Canon, it doesn't matter what is right or wrong. It's what we think is right and what we think is wrong. Because, obviously, part of Kenya thought the constitutional amendments were right and part of Kenya thought that they were wrong. Always you must remember that your views are not everybody's views. But so long as you are at peace with yourself for the decisions you make, I will take the consequences. And I took the consequences. I lost the mayoral position. Not a small position to lose, but I lost it. And I knew I would lose it. And I was happy with thank that. You. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Canon Karanja. I'm not through yet. Uh, I'll ask uh, Professor Elb Said to ask one more question on that particular topic. Professor. Uh, Mr. Tai, <coughs> how will the new commission be different from the outgoing one? And uh, what difference will they make? The new commission not only should but must be different in this sense first and foremost. We must open our arms and we must open up our information to all our stakeholders. We must consult highly with them. We must ensure that we win their support. If not their support, at least their understanding. And if not their understanding, at least their realization that we are a, a free, fair arbiter, referee. That is number one. Number two, we must clean our house. 
we must clean our house. And that comes again with the audit. Not an audit by word, but an audit by deed. Not by people who do not know what an audit is, but by people who are competent in conducting audits and then implementing these audits. But, Professor, it is critical to, to accept that the running of elections is a twin function of the technical side and of the human side. Managing elections is more about managing the tempers, the emotions, the perceptions that are out there in the political field that are being propagated by political parties, that is being disseminated by the politicians, or that is not being disseminated by the politicians. And if we do not get our game right at that level, then we are doomed. But we will not. We will provide that leadership. We will make sure that we are hand in glove with all our stakeholders and integrity must be first and foremost. If the political players do not perceive us, not even whether we are or not, but whether if they perceive us as not free and fair, then we have lost the game. We must not lose it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. And uh, just one very short question from Dr. Mohan Lumba on the same topic. Just as a follow-up to Professor's question, I would like to ask you, if you were the chair, if you are elected, nominated to be the next chair of IBC, what will be your relationship with the outgoing commissioners? Thank you very much for that question, Mr. Mohan. It's, it's something I have thought about, actually, for quite some time. And I asked myself, what should it be and what is proper, what is politically correct? I decided to avoid what is politically correct and decided to go for what is pragmatic. If you look also at the parliamentary report by the select uh, committee, they made no findings as to the character or the actions of the outgoing commissioners. So to me, I should not hesitate to at least talk to them to enable a smooth passing of the baton, so to speak. There are people who, there are people who have been in that office, they have probably worked uh, hard in that office. Without judging them, I would want to find out if there was anything that is useful that they would like the incoming commission to be aware of. To ignore them will be a mistake. Just second question regarding the commission. As a chairman, Suppose you're the chairman of the IPC. What will be your take? Or could you overrule decisions made by other commissioners? The act is very clear, sir. It is very clear that the commission acts collectively. The chair provides the leadership. There are certain things. The chair is a spokesperson. The chair takes the lead in so many areas. But even if the law did not provide for it, it will be a mistake for the chair to act alone. You lose the commission, you have started unraveling everything else. You will lose the commissioners, you will lose the secretariat, you will lose the political players, you will lose the stakeholders, and you are left with nothing. Thank you. Uh, the next questions, I think they have been answered. I was, well, they, they were, uh, Justice Baluto was going to ask you a few questions. Do you still want to ask? I think they have been answered, yeah. You have in your answering the other questions, also touched on what he was going to talk to you about. Most of so uh, there's one last question, which I'm going to still ask Dr. Lumba to ask you on a different topic, yeah. What are the key? What are the key security challenges facing Kenya? And what are, in your opinion, solutions to such challenges? The biggest security challenge, in my humble opinion, is the security of our borders. 
they are porous, they have been a challenge, but I believe also the government is actively addressing and trying to redress that situation. Most obvious of which is the threat that is posed by Al-Shabaab, which in the conduct of elections cannot be overemphasized and cannot be underplayed by whatever nature. That is number one. Number two is that over the years, our great republic has by default allowed the growth or the taking root of informal organizations that have discovered that they are able to accumulate great wealth by organizing and replacing and filling the vacuum that has been there in so many spheres of our lives. These organized gangs, if I may say, are there in almost every sphere of our life. I wouldn't like to go into the details because I wouldn't like to uh, invite controversy. But now they have also realized that in addition to their organization bringing them wealth, they can actually organize in addition to wealth to bring themselves political office. And they have no hesitation in using their expertise on application of violence, illegitimate violence, to achieve their ends. To, to my, in my humble opinion, these organized gangs, these terror groups, are also a threat that cannot be overlooked in terms not only of our country, but directly in respect to the organizing and holding of free, fair, and transparent, transparent elections. And the third sphere is the tendency of politicians in organizing their own so-called youth wings to ensure that their will prevails. And this is less of a threat because it is on local, uh, uh, very local level, and is supposed to be for a period of the time that is limited to the election campaigns. But nevertheless, it is a threat. What about corruption and security? In fact, none of those others could have taken place if corruption was not their precursor. Corruption allows all these three to take place. And yes, I stand corrected, sir. Corruption is our number one security threat. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lumba. And I, once again, thank you, Mr. Taib. Thank you, madam. Yeah, we have come to the more or less formal uh, question or conversation with my colleagues. Oh, oh sorry, there's one more question, sorry. Yes. Uh, <coughs> madam Ogla, did you have a question on general knowledge? One question, please. Tell us something about the implementation of devolution. About? The implementation of devolution. In general, yes. I think we had the commission for the implementation of devolution. And uh, we have seen that the implementation of devolution has presented so many challenges, most of which were taken to court. I had also the honor of sitting in the McQueney Commission, which was supposed to return a ruling on whether that commission should be dissolved or not. Luckily, the process did not reach the level of being recommended to the Senate. Certainly, devolution, in my opinion, is something of great significance and has come into being because the people of Kenya wanted it, and we can see the benefits of devolution. But the picture of devolution has been contaminated by the legal wrangling that has been going on in terms of who has what power over what function, which is normal, because I think even the framers of the Constitution said the period they were giving it is 10 years to be able to come up with a sound document. But by and large, I, in my humble opinion, believe that devolution and the process of devolving functions of government has taken place at an acceptable rate, to an acceptable level. It is something that is overwhelmingly supported by Kenyans. It is something that needs to be strengthened uh, further. And 
it has presented, more specifically to the IEBC, a great challenge because of the number of offices now that have to be, uh, whose elections have to be conducted. But uh, other than that general view, I will be more than happy to answer any specific uh, query. Thank you. Olga? Okay. Uh, sorry, <laughs> it's, there was that question uh, which uh, Ogla had, and mm. I've answered it. Thank you very much. Thank Most you, Ogla, like. and thank you, uh, Mr. Taib. Um, I wish to now address you and uh, address everybody else on a matter that is important for us as a panel. When we were nominated to these positions, we I, as you rightly know, we didn't apply for them, but we accepted to do the work for this country. Yes. And uh, it's not an easy job. However, we are committed to it. We promise that we'll be completely transparent in what we do. And in that, we follow the law to the letter, like you yourself has said it so many times here. Yes. <laughs> and the law demands that when we have advertised the positions, we sh uh, publish the full list of all the applicants. I think you remember we, uh, we, are, we published this, including the second uh, advertisement, we published all that. And then after shortlisting, there's a requirement that as a panel, we also published that list giving all possible qualifications of all the candidates that we have shortlisted and at the same time invite the general public and also write to the agencies within the government and elsewhere to give us views on the candidates that we have shortlisted. This is an effort for us and which is very good to help us determine the, the suitability of all the candidates that we have shortlisted. And what, in your case, we have received a memoranda from one member of the public. It's a very short one. And as this panel determined in their procedures that we shall not ambush any candidate at, uh, at, the, just at the time of interview, Correct. It has been brought to your attention before you walked into this room. Correct. Is that true? That is true, my lady. Yes. Now, as chair of I, my colleagues talk to you, and I want to put the question to you, that this matter, which has been brought to your attention, yes. which touches on you as a person, we would like to know whether you would like this matter to be discussed in the public with the media present, and all the members of the general public present, or would like us to recess to go to another, uh, to, to in a camera to have this matter discussed. And I would like you to give me the direction. Would you like us to discuss this matter in public or in a camera? My lady, I would very much want this matter to be discussed in public. So the process I, of credibility starts here and now. Thank you. Uh, may I uh, therefore let my colleagues, members of the panel, the media, and the general public, to know that the matter before us uh, has been brought to Mr. Taib before he came into his, this uh, interview room. And he has now requested that this matter be discussed in full view of the general public and the media. And I will therefore request my colleague, uh, uh, do, Dr. Bishop uh, David Oginde, the bishop, uh, to summarize what it is, and then I would ask you kindly to respond. It's a very short matter, and as we said, we are trying to manage time. I would like you to respond to it very quickly, yes. and then we move forward. Most so I now request Bishop Oginde to go. Thank you, Chair. The matter before us is brought by one uh, Mohammed. Baishe, I hope I pronounced that name correctly. Yes. And uh, his concern is that uh, back in 1991, you represented him as a lawyer in a matter that was uh, in a court in Mombasa, uh, a case that eventually won and was awarded some 229,730 shillings. 
Uh, his concern is that after the end of that case, you abandoned him and did not follow up uh, the payment of that money, and therefore he did not benefit from the ruling that was given by the court. And uh, he wonders, therefore, if you could do that to him, whether you could provide leadership in such a big organization. Chelidi, the story of Mr. Mohamed Baishe is a story that will bring sadness to anybody's heart. In on or about 1990, he and his wife were assaulted by administration police of the islands of Lamu. And uh, he was beaten very severely. He was hurt. He was incarcerated together with his wife. And he lost all his property in the rampage that followed. At that time, if, if, if I will put it in context, Nobody was willing to take any case against the government. It was 1990, after all. But we took his matter. We sued the Ministry of the Interior, at that time known as the, uh, uh, the Administration and Internal Security uh, Ministry, and won his case after huge delays. Again, the judiciary we have now is a huge improvement on the judiciary we had then. So after almost uh, 10 years, we finally finished the case and won the case. And he had about that figure of 229,000, but which, by the way, now is almost a million shillings that is supposed to be due to him, not 229. It is almost a million shillings that is supposed to be due to him. We obtained the warrants. We tried to execute the warrants against, guess who? The PS Internal Security, who is in charge of the police, and were unable to do so. We tried all manner of uh, procedures to be able to execute these warrants, but are unable to do so because the person we wanted to execute them against was the person in charge of the arm of the executive that controls legitimate use of violence. So we went back to the drawing board and decided to file judicial review uh, cases. By the way, there are, there are two cases, not one. There's a case in respect of him there's a case in respect of his wife also, both of which in which we have judgment. So we filed judicial review proceedings seeking for orders of mandamus against the PS, Ministry of the Interior now. We obtained those orders successfully, and they were ordered to make the payments. We wrote not less than 20 uh, uh, pieces of correspondence to the Attorney General to use his good offices to ensure the coming to fruition of that judgment so that Mr. Baishe and his wife may enjoy the compensation that they so rightly and so richly deserve. Again, it came to naught. There were no responses and we were unable to execute that judgment. Now, we went to the third limb and we filed an application for committal of the PS internal security for contempt of the court's orders to pay Mr. Baishe and his wife, which perhaps again may answer Canon Karanja's question about what risks I'm, uh, I am willing to take. I don't mind to take on the PS internal security, so long as I'm doing it again within the law. That application for the jailing of the PS internal security is coming up for hearing in February. And we have been informing Mr. Baishe in correspondence. But now that he has complained, I am assuming that his physical location in the islands of Lamu has something to do with his inability to receive the correspondence. Uh, I know for a certain I have asked him for his emails, but he doesn't have an email, he doesn't have a computer, and he doesn't operate uh, such. But I meet him in Mombasa, and I explain to him the position. And that is the current status of the matter. We have done three separate proceedings over the years. The last stage, that is committal of the PS internal security for contempt of the court order to pay Mr. Baishe the over one million shillings he's entitled to, is coming up in February of 2017. And my heart goes out for Mr. Baishe. My heart really goes out to him. And I hope 
we are able to successfully conclude this matter. Mr. Taib, I want to thank you for your response. We've taken note of what you have told us. Yes, I'm happy that you say you'll reach out to Mr. Uh, Baisha, Baisha, yes. and uh, that would be very good for him to get to know what uh, actions you have taken or you are taking. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to tell you that that's the only uh, memoranda we got from about you. Uh, we received you. all the other positive things from the other agencies, <laughs> and uh, therefore, this brings the end of this conversation. Uh, this brings to, to an end the conversation that we have been having with you this morning. Most of uh, Normally, still I'll ask you to take some water. I, Please. <laughs> it helps me also to take mine. Yeah? Uh, Mr. Taib, it has been a pleasure for us as a panel uh, to talk to you. And we want to thank you for sharing your views and your experiences in various places of leadership also, and for your commitment to your integrity in the, in the way you have. As you know, we are talking to about 10 people yes. about this position. Therefore, I would like to uh, inform you that uh, now time has come for you to know that we don't know the outcome of the other nine people Correct. we are going to talk to. But in the in the event that you are not the one picked, on behalf of the panel, I would like you to keep that spirit you have of Thank serving you. this nation, Thank you. of serving Kenyans, and being concerned on the bigger picture of the Kenyan nation, and Thank saying you. this is where the way. So not all of us can be chairs of IABC. Okay. So in whatever position you are, you continue to do that. Uh, before you leave, I'll ask you, do you have any question that you want to ask this person, a panel, or you want to ask me any, pa any question of any kind, or you'd like to make a comment to us as a panel? I have no questions, my lady, but I would like to say something with your permission and with your... Yeah, yeah you, are you. you are very welcome. You are very welcome. First of all is to thank you so much for your public spirit. I know you have all left your work, you have all left your obligations, you have so many of them, but this is what governing is about. You sacrifice. I want you to know one thing. If God permits, he finds it in favor to grant me this position, I will do it conscientiously to the best of my ability so that I may go down, hopefully, on the record, to have rendered my country a service both for the country's sake and for my own family's sake. And if I am not successful, I will also sigh a sigh of relief because it is not an obligation that I will ask anyone to take lightly. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Mr. Chaib, thank you very much. And we wish you all the best in whatever endeavors you are involved in. And uh, may you be escorted out by uh, the gentleman next to you. May I also request that your documentation, which we have looked through, uh, ensure that you have everything before you leave this building. Thank you and all the best. Yeah, thank you. You are very welcome. Yeah, thank you.